But yeah, I was tasked with the, uh, the obligation or the privilege, depending on your ideological line, to give a lecture on Stalinism. And uh, I have to admit, even though I initially am the one who said it, uh, there's a bit of dishonesty in this presentation. And I've been, like I said, tasked to give a lecture on Stalinism. Uh, however, Stalinism doesn't exist. Uh, Stalinism is a term that anarchists, Trotskyists, and left communists use as a slur against Marxist-Leninists, especially Marxist-Leninists um, pursuing uh, the project of the Soviet Union after Lenin's death, uh, generally under the leadership of Stalin, uh, to the secret speech by Nikita Khrushchev. Um, but there is no coherent definition or understanding of ideology uh, that can be applied. In fact, um, it's used from uh, people as different from Stalin himself, uh, Enveri, uh, Hoaxa, uh, Mao Zedong, uh, Che Guevara, to Kim Song-il, uh, and it's basically thrown, and there's no inherent links between any of them that can be teased out. Um, and even though this is uh, a theory lecture, um, I will try and give a theoretical apparatus that is most notably called Stalinism, which again, I think is just, just Marxist-Leninism in practice. Um, and then I will have to do this through the historical examples, because again, theoretically, Stalinism doesn't exist. It's Marxist-Leninism in practice. And so, unfortunately, I will be drawn into also giving historical examples to sort of give grounding for the theoretical constructs. And again, I, at each step of the way, I will try to link this directly to Marxist-Leninism, both theoretically and historically. Um, so, uh, basically, Stalinism can be broken down into three primary tasks. The first is that communists must suppress internal counter-revolutionaries. Secondly, they must positively build socialism. And finally, they must protect socialism from foreign el elements bent on its destruction. And of course, we can see this historically, most notably through the Stalinist collectivization, the purges, and the USSR's foreign policy, and the so-called socialism in one country theory um, that gets thrown about. And like I said, at every step of the way, I will try and link this so-called Stalinism to Leninism. So first, the Soviet Union arose out of feudal Russia. They didn't have a large amount of industrial workers, known as the proletariat. Um, and instead, most of the people in Russia were peasants, right? They worked individual plots of land or worked for a landlord. Moreover, the ruling class at the time of the February Revolution, this was the first Russian Revolution that caused the abdication of the Tsar, um, at this time in February of uh, 1917, it was basically a feudal, monarchist, and aristocratic ruling class. Um, the bourgeoisie, right, known as the capitalists, the factory owners, the bankers, etc., did not have the same power that they had in Western countries. So, of course, the composition of the USSR remained incredibly mixed. This consequently led to various classes having wildly different class interests, right? And, of course, consequently, these conflicting interests led to a massive amount of internal strife within the country. The proletariat as a class, right, the workers, sought to create industrialized socialism, right, the, the traditional notion of Marxism or communism. Uh, the bourgeois, of course, sought counter-revolution um, and a return to capitalism, possibly liberalism, although many of the bourgeois, that is the rich owners, were more than happy to have Dinkinen or Wrangel or any of the other white aristocratic strongmen be in place. So there were some liberal bourgeois, but there were also monarchist bourgeois of the white, the white Russians. Um, finally, the petit bourgeois, who are like small business owners, artisans, craft people, sought to return to just a general market system. Uh, oftentimes, they would have a conception of socialism, which is that people would be freed from large capitalists, large bankers, but many of them themselves hoped to be large capitalists, large bankers. So we have conflicts even within right, the, the, the structured classes. Um, and then, of course, the real difficulty uh, among uh, conflicting desires arose within the peasants. This would be the vast majority of Russians. The poor peasants wanted uh, 
socialism for the society, um, but mostly collectivization for the, ple the peasant class, right? If you have very little uh, land, you work land owned by someone else, it makes perfect sense that this large plot of land you work can be divvied up around the families who work it, and rather than being individually owned, right, that would be petit bourgeois, you own the means of your own production, what they would want is a collective farm, right? And so it would be more efficient, they could use new industry, new technology, and that way they wouldn't have to worry about starvation um, periodically. They wouldn't have to worry about, you know, getting a market price. They could work it essentially like uh, a factory, right? Um, but of course it would be collectivization rather than, you know, socialism proper because it's not, it, it at the time was not industrialized. Um, so this also led to another class of peasants, the rich peasants who were named as the Kulaks, who wanted individual trade and freer markets. Now these peasants might want land reform, but they wouldn't want land reform in uh, a notion of collectively owned farms. They would want large feudal estates broken down into individual chunks, right, and then divvied out to individuals. So those individuals could then pursue the market forces and you know gain more money and essentially become rich landowners themselves uh, was the goal of many of the kulaks. So of course, right, um, the bourgeois <laughs> class obviously served to disrupt the building of socialism. However, right, the peasants are going to provide the real enigma, right, because you have all sorts of conflicting forces and desires at play. And of course, the peasants then, because they're the vast majority, would prove crucial to either side's victory. The kulaks fighting for the bourgeois sought to enrich themselves, again, with personal wealth, and the poorer peasants viewed their self-interest as tied up with the collective interests of the whole. Lenin, of course, faced this problem during the revolution. He instituted war communism, which entailed forced requisition of uh, grain when the peasants, especially the richer peasants, refused to feed soldiers or sell grain or accept um, uh, basically uh, IOUs, um, you know, bonds uh, for repayment, that when they refused to accept that, right, he instituted requisition in order to feed the soldiers, right, to get grain to feed the soldiers and to feed the cities, right, so the desperate struggle, the young republic would survive. Um, the general hostilities after, after the initial civil war um, and the threat of invasion replaced the immediate dangers of war. So instead of having right, open conflict, there's always looming in the background the threat of invasion from the Western powers and always a threat of a reemergence of civil war. Right? So of course one should not understand that this did not make the situation less perilous. Right? It's just as dangerous and at any given moment you know, the young socialist republic could have been torn apart by any numerous forces, both internal and external. So, Lenin instituted a, a declared temporary new economic program, which loosened market regulations in an attempt to stabilize the economy, right? That after a bloody civil war was, unsurprisingly, in fairly bad shape. Um, now, at this point, um, one should understand that many thought the Soviet Union should undergo rapid industrial, uh, industrialization and collectivization. Others argued for a more moderate approach, right, letting the NEP run its course and gradually working into collectivization. Stalin actually fell in with the more moderate group because he didn't want to jeopardize the gains made by the Soviet Union by pushing them into a new radical policy that would reignite conflict between the classes and open alternatives, right, for foreign invasion. So, in this case, the Soviet Union allowed the peasants to grow rich and the faction for collectivization led by Trotsky fell out of power. But again, it's important to note that this was not simply power politics, but there was, in fact, policy issues that are deciding who would ascend, such as it was, and who would fall. In this case, uh, Kamenev and Zinovev, uh, and later Bukharin, were the more moderate um, so-called right-wing faction or center faction, depending. They're, right, they're the right-wing faction if you're a Trotskyist. They're the center faction if you're a, you know, a Stalinist or, I would contend, right, a rigorous Marxist-Leninist. Um, but again, it was a moderate policy. It was an attempt to avoid plunging the Soviet Union once again into civil war. However, uh, 
Soon the rich peasants began to hoard grain in order to bend society to their interests. If the Soviets did nothing, the rich peasants would have uh, disintegrated the new society and restored capital. Because again, these market reforms, rather than being temporary institutions, right, if you hold the bread, right, you hold the reins of power. And so these temporary institutions would have been, you know, reinscribed as essentially the way of doing business in the Soviet Union. And that would have put the rich farmers basically in the driver's seat. So a new consensus emerged that collectivization would halt the return to capitalism. Stalin recognized the necessity of collectivization in the face of the emergent Kulak class and once again sided with the majority um, to end the po possible capitalist restoration. Uh, the Kulaks, of course, resisted the process of collectivization. Uh, they burned their crops and slaughtered their animals rather than turning them over to officials. Um, unsurprisingly, the Soviet officials responded harshly to the subversive activities of the Kulaks. They seized property, uh, they executed or deported those who resisted, right, this would be the, to Siberia, not externally. Um, and at last, collectivization ended peasant resistance and the Soviet Union can move forward uh, on industrializing without fear of peasants withholding food. Again, and this is very important, Stalin did not take the lead but use his personal judgment to side with the group that he thought would defend the Soviet Union. Um, and again, we see the principles of a defense against internal enemies and a desire to build socialism as holding sway, rather than power politics. In fact, uh, what seems like something incredibly opportunist, he turns against some of his best allies. For example, Bukharin did not want to engage in collectivization because Bukharin was one of the main proponents, right, of releasing, uh, you know, market fetters, releasing regulations. But when the Kulaks again began to hold more and more power, something desperate needed to be done. And Bukharin, who again, viewed Stalin basically as a stooge and someone who would support him, uh, was sadly mistaken when Stalin basically reinstituted war communism and institutionalized it rather than making it a temporary policy. So, of course, uh, in this, during this entire period, right, from the uh, time of Lenin's death to the end of collectivization, right, which is going to be uh, 32, 33, uh, the character of the international situation changed drastically, right, after the collectivization ended in the early 30s. Hitler and Mussolini led the rise in fascism across the globe that threatened once again to engulf the Soviet Union in war. The Soviet Union attempted to build coalitions known as popular fronts against the fascists within their, the, the fascists' own countries, but also within other countries in order to stop the spread of fascism. Um, the Soviet Union during this time began to fund uh, the uh, Spanish Repu uh, Republicans, or more precisely, to arm the Spanish Republicans in order to prevent the nationalist forces from taking over. And it's worth noting that England, France, and the United States not only refused to aid the Spanish re uh, Republicans, but actively worked to prevent aid uh, from reaching their governments. The only exception is France went back and forth on whether they would allow volunteers or aid to come through their borders. But again, uh, it's often you know, given as a, perf uh, you know, a purely calculating, self-serving uh, right, power play by Stalin to gain international recognition. But as a matter of fact, the Soviet Union was one of a few lone voices internationally willing to stand up to fascism at this time. Um, so again, we have here a principled defense, going back to the, the three principles, to prevent an external threat from toppling socialism in Spain, but also right, ultimately turning towards the Soviet Union. Um, along those lines, the Spanish Republicans completely failed to gain any important objectives from the fascists. The Spanish Republicans did not form a unified government, but stood as a coalition of Republican liberals, communists, anarchists, syndicalists, trade unionists, and those basically just generally opposed to fascism. These groups remained fairly autonomous uh, and free from any central control. And these groups not only resisted the central government's efforts uh, to a coordinated defense, but often engaged, uh, as Nathan said, right, in skirmishes against each other. And not simply Marxists against anarchists, 
But there were Marxist groups against Marxist groups, um, the uh, POM, the party of Marxist liberation or Marxist unification, um, fighting right, the Soviets. You also have um, anarchists, various syndicalist anarchists, anarcho-communists, right, fighting each other as well, although less often than the split between communists and anarchists. But again, you have internal skirmish skirmishes ostensibly between allies. So, of course, um, right, uh, the, uh, let's see, uh, Stalin and the Soviet Union refused to continue to fund or arm the Spanish Republicans without a centralized army. Uh, they basically offered an ultimatum, either centralize the Republican forces or lose aid. And that was left to the Spanish to do. Um, and of course, as, his, as history has shown, they chose to centralize, um, which put them in direct conflict with the various anarchist federations, the various syndicalist federations. But again, it was ultimately a Spanish decision to centralize rather than just lose Soviet aid. However, the centralization of the Spanish Republicans basically came too late, and the factional infighting had already ripped the Republic apart. The Republican forces were split and reeling from the fascist advances. Uh, as Nathan said, the entire country was cut in two. Um, and in Europe, France, England had signed, um, in addition, right, in Europe, France and England had signed a mutual defense treaty with Czechoslovakia, and this is, um, I believe, in 38. And they actually ended up demanding that Czechoslovakia give up the Sudetenland, its most defensible area, um, to Germany in the name of peace, right? This is Neville Chamberman, Chamberlain causes Czechoslovakia to give up their land, uh, you know, so that he can secure a peace for our time, um, as he calls it. Uh, basically, at this point, the Soviet Union sought accommodation with the fascists because the UK and France had never made any serious efforts to reciprocate any mutual defense. They had not come to the aid of the Spanish Republicans, and we had just seen in Czechoslovakia, they had literally sold out an ally that they had a mutual defense treaty with. And keep in mind, Czechoslovakia was not socialist, right? It was a good liberal capitalist nation. Of course, the Soviets thought, why wouldn't they sell us out at the drop of a hat? I mean, that's a, pers a perfectly reasonable position to have. So, of course, they figured, why not um, seek accommodations with the fascists, right? Because the UK and France completely refused to join an anti-fascist front. So, of course, um, this led to the accommodations, which included the restoration of the Baltic states and the Eastern European states under Tsarist control, right? And this is, would also be the partition of Poland. This is Latvia, right? I mean, Baltic states, you know, Estonia. Um, but again, these were part of Tsarist Russia. So we're not seeing any necessarily imperial uh, ambitions, but we're seeing the Soviet Union that has no real way to go making accommodations with Germany uh, because essentially the UK and France are completely unreliable in any way, shape, or form. And of course, you'll notice I didn't mention the United States because at this point, the United States had completely isolated itself more or less from world affairs. Um, and it's again, it's a desire to protect socialism, right, the Soviet Union proper. It's a desire to build socialism in these new territories acquired. Um, and also it serves as a buffer against, right, the fascist invasion. Um, and it's worth noting at this point uh, Stalin's conception of uh, the resources at his aid. And he makes two big distinctions. Uh, he says, and by the way, all of these quotes will be from On the Foundations of Leninism by Joseph Stalin, which again would be the best place, one of the best places to go to get his ideological view. Um, he talks about the strategic leadership, right, of the vanguard, and he says that the reserves of the revolution can be A, right, direct, um, the peasantry and in general the immediate strata of population within the country, B, the proletariat of neighboring countries. C, the revolutionary movements in the colonies or dependent colonies. D, uh, the conquests and gains of the dictatorship of the proletariat, part of which the proletariat may give up temporarily by retaining su superior por uh, forces in order to buy off a powerful uh, enemy and gain respite. So again, you'll notice the thought here is, right, you buy off the fascists to gain a breathing room, to gain time. 
or B, uh, right, indirect resources, which would be the contradictions and conflicts among non-proletarian classes within the country, which can be utilized by the proletariat to weaken the enemy and strengthen its own reserves. B, the contradictions, conflicts, and wars, the imperialist war, for instance, between the bourgeois states hostile to the proletarian stage, which can be utilized by the proletariat and its offensives in maneuvering the event or if forced to retreat. So again, we have imperialist states like Germany and Italy going to war with other imperialist states like, the, or like England and France, right? And so he saw this as an indirect support of the Soviet Union. Now, internationally at this time, Trotsky continued to issue statements calling for resistance to Stalin in the Central Committee. And it was here, under the threat of fascism, right, not abstract fascism, right, but direct, immediate fascism on the borders with no allies willing to push into one's country, that Stalin began the great purges within the party leadership and the Red Army. These purges were motivated by the desire to remove the unreliable political elements and those officers most deeply affected by Trotsky's formation of the Red Army. Once again, we have at play here the three principles. One is a defense against internal enemies, those corrupted by their own political ambitions or those still loyal to Trotsky. Two, the building of socialism through the reorganization of the political and military class. Again, to break the bureaucracy, to break uh, the sort of military bureaucracy and the threat of Bonapartism, right, which is where the military rises up, replaces the political government, and institutes itself as the new government, as Bonaparte did uh, right in the French Revolution. And then, finally, um, we have the necessary reorganization and industrialization to defend against the fascist menace. It's important to note, Russia lost in World War I. And it lost so badly that the government was overthrown. So this leads us into roughly the World War II period. In the West, everyone conceives of World War II beginning in 1939 and the invasion of Poland, or, right, as Nathan said, uh, the Spanish Civil War. It's worth noting that the Japanese invaded China, right, or, or were basically engaged in adventurism in China, in 1933. And not only that, is Japan actually invaded the Soviet Union um, in 1934, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if any of you are familiar, there was the Russo-Japanese uh, War in 1905, in which the Russians were absolutely obliterated. Uh, and they lost vast amounts of territory, they were beaten and driven back, and this in fact, once again, led to a revolution in 1905 that ultimately failed, right, the 1905 revolution. Um, when the Japanese invaded the Soviet Union this time, they were absolutely destroyed. Uh, they were annihilated. They were decimated. You had entire divisions of Japanese surrendering to the Russians. Um, you'll notice the Japanese never invaded the Soviet Union in World War II. And there's a very good reason why they didn't, right? Because it seems quite simple. You have the Soviet Union that is, right, up to Moscow, right, fighting off the Nazis. It would seem a very simple thing, right, for Japan to invade, push through the other side, right, and take all of the natural resources and push its way into the industrial centers behind the Urals. The reason that they didn't is because they were so utterly smashed by the Soviet forces that they were hesitant of ever invading them again. And so, through this brutal, admittedly, violent process of purging internal enemies, of forced collectivization, of forced industrialization, of a decline in consumption among the Soviet workers, the Soviet Union was able to build up the military, political, and economic forces to stop, almost single-handedly, Nazi Germany. Now, there's an important side note that one should uh, keep in mind about Stalin here. So it's often portrayed that Stalin and Hitler were best buds. Um, this is not at all the case. Stalin was engaged in a political maneuver. And at the time, right, 1941, of the German invasion, Stalin had expected 
Hitler to give him more time to industrialize. And th this, this shows a little bit of the mindset of Stalin. Uh, you can read a book, it's called In the Courts uh, of the Red Tsar uh, by Sibag Montefier, who is the son of an aristocratic Englishman. Okay, so this is not a source that is particularly well disposed to Stalin. And what he notices is, through the archives, when Nazi Germany invades the Soviet Union, Stalin is at his docha, right, his winter home, um, I believe on the Black Sea. And he hears this news, and he goes into a state of shock for a couple hours. But he doesn't call the Central Committee, and he doesn't return to Moscow. And he actually stays there for two days. And the interesting thing is this. Stalin expected the Central Committee to send the NVKD, or the, N yeah, uh, the secret police, to arrest him and have him executed for incompetence. He expected to be held responsible for his failure. And the very first thing he did when returning to the Central Committee was he tendered his resignation. That was the very first thing he did. Of course, at this time, right, the, the Central Committee, the Politburo, right, the, the political elites at the time, realized that they could not win this war without Stalin. The people were posit so well positively disposed to Stalin that if they removed him in the face of another figure, they imagined that many of the Russians, many of the Ukrainians, would actually join the Nazis to fight against them. And even in this case, many did join the Nazis to fight against the Soviet Union. Now, I don't want to get too much into the details of World War II, but let me say this. The invasion of Sevastopol, uh, which was a single city, had more troops than all the troops that landed at D-Day. The number of troops in Stalingrad and Kursk combined was more than all of the troops fighting on the Western Front from the beginning of the war until D-Day. The Soviet Union single-handedly stopped the Nazis. By the time the Americans were landing in D-Day, because of the Battle of Stalingrad, which destroyed their infantry, and because of the Battle of Kursk, which destroyed their armor, the Germans were already in full retreat. So again, the Soviet Union, under the leadership of Stalin, the Marxist-Leninist leadership of Stalin, the rigorous party discipline, was able to stop the Germans where previously the Tsars were unable to. So after the war, it's, and, and again, this is, once again, once you keep in mind the three principles, the negotiations with the Allies was, was done in, in good faith. Um, he wholly expected the Allies to not continue to threaten the Soviet Union. He expected the Allies to hold to their agreements. And very quickly, it was found that this was a mistaken belief. It's also worth noting that Stalin initially held to all of his agreements, um, especially with the British. Two big things should be kept in mind. Um, Berlin was supposed to be split into four districts. One Soviet, one British, one American, and one French. It was the Americans, with their allied support, who unified all of those into a single administrative district under the Americans. It was the Allies with NATO who formed, who formed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization first. The Warsaw Pact was formed in reaction to NATO. And also, Stalin, right, again, trying to protect the gains made uh, under right, the bloody fighting of World War II, promised the British that he would not give aid to the Communist Party of Greece. And he held good to that. And the Communist Party of Greece rose up against the fascistic monarchist government and received no aid 
Because again, he made an agreement to protect the rest of the Soviet Union, and in doing so, did not support right, this other communist movement. And so, right, this continues. Uh, the Soviet Union becomes an arsenal for socialism. They continue to fund countries where they can. But again, it seems absolutely clear, right, that the defense of the Soviet Union is worth more than risky expeditions on untested parties. And one should keep this in mind when viewing Stalinism as simply cynical opportunism at a power grab. Instead, it's a recognition that real existing Soviet or real existing socialism is worth defending and sacrificing things for, even if it appears no, even if it is morally repugnant. So just, I, I mean, this sort of leads us theoretically to what is known as socialism in one country, right? Um, Stalin believed that socialism could be built in one country. This is absolutely true. But of course, what's the alternative? If socialism can't be built in one country, it has to be built internationally. What was the Soviet Union to do? Was it supposed to join socialist Germany and socialist France and socialist England and the socialist United States? in a united socialist front? No. It was a single besieged country that went from being a backwards of Europe to one of two superpowers. And of course, here's what Stalin specifically has to say about that. The overthrow of the power of the bourgeois and the establishment of the power of the proletariat in one country does not yet mean the complete victory of socialism has been ensured. After consolidating its power and leading the peasantry in its wake, the proletariat of the victorious country can and must build a socialist society. But does this mean that it will thereby achieve a complete and final victory of socialism? I.e., does that mean that the forces of only one country, it can finally consolidate socialism and fully guarantee the country against intervention and consequently also uh, against restoration? No, it does not. For this victory of the revolution in at least several countries is needed. Therefore, the development and support of the revolution in other countries is an essential task of the victorious revolution. Therefore, the revolution which has been victorious in one country must regard itself not as a self-sufficient entity, but as an aid, as a means for hastening the victory of the proletariat in other countries. And then, uh, finally, right... In his own words, this is what Stalin sees as Marxist-Leninism. And this is what people characterize as Stalinism. Uh, speaking of revolution and victory, what is needed to attain this? To attain this, it is necessary to carry out at least three main tasks that confront the dictatorship of the proletariat, quote, on the morrow of victory. A, to break the resistance of the landlord and capitalists who have overthrown and expropriated uh, who have been overthrown and expropriated by the revolution, to liquidate every attempt on their part to restore the power of capital, and to liquidate every attempt on their part to restore the power of capital, B, to organize the construction in such a way to rally all the working people around the proletariat, and to carry on this work through the lines of preparing for the elimination or abolition of classes, i.e. communism, and C, to arm the revolution, to organize the army of the revolution for the struggle against foreign enemies, for the struggle against imperialism. And as a final thought, I believe it was Adorno who was in a written conversation with Mar uh, Martin Heidegger, right, who was a famous Nazi professor uh, of psych uh, philosophy, right, and Marcuse being a communist. And... Uh, or, sorry, Adorno. And uh, Heidegger writes Adorno and says, well, all you have to do is look at collectivization. Look at the elimination of the kulaks. Look at the forced deportation of Eastern Germany. That is by far more brutal than anything the Nazis ever did. More people died in those actions than ever died in a concentration camp or in Nazi aggression. And Adorno writes back, 
The difference between collectivization and the forced deportation of the Soviet Union is the thin difference between civilization and barbarism. And so, again, uh, I wish that I could give a lecture on Stalinism, but there is no such thing. There is only Marxist-Leninism and the recognition of the exigencies of revolution. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, objections? Yeah, why not? Sure. So um, the problem with Stalinism, as far as I'm concerned, as far as what most people see as the problem with Stalinism, it's not so much the ideologies themselves, but of course the things that the ideologies were used to justify. And in this case, we kind of skimmed over uh, the content of what the purges were on. I'm certainly not an expert historically. I'm wondering if you can give a little more detail on what actually happened death toll and so on? Um, the death toll is disputed. Um, I, I would, for anyone interested in communist crimes, uh, the Black Book of Communism is fantastic. Um, and it's, it, it, it has, as far as these things go, right, everything's going to be formidable. It has probably the most rigorous history of anti-communists. Um, but of course, it's completely decontextualized. Uh, those who died under the crimes of Stalin, uh, millions, millions died, uh, almost certainly. And why they died is going to be different in each case. For example, uh, those who died in the Ukraine under the Holodomor, um, which was characterized as a genocide against the Ukrainian people. Um, well, Ukraine was the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, and the, this was the area where they would withhold food. And not only would they withhold food, but they would slaughter and burn and hide food rather than hold, give it over to the officials uh, who would then transport it to the starving cities. Um, so why they died uh, is because of their active resistance. Um, this was in fact one of, it, it, was, it was not a passive resistance. This was not uh, a Gandhi-esque, uh, you know, peaceful protest. Um, there was fighting. It, it was essentially another civil war. And it was so brutal uh, that there was massive psychological toll on the soldiers who were engaged in it. And in fact, it's rumored, uh, no one is entirely sure of what happened, but the general consen consensus, even among anti-Stalinist um, uh, sources, um, is that Stalin's wife committed suicide over the brutality of collectivization. Um, but again, the reason those people died was quite clearly because if you withhold food, then you're an enemy. And it was a state of war. It was conceptualized as a state of war. Of course, if you have liberal jur jurisprudence, you, you can simply say, well, that was their property and they can dispose of it how they wish. Um, however, that was not the, the nature of Soviet law. Um, the Don Cossacks. Um, Cossacks, of course, were an ethnic group but also they were granted privilege rights under the Tsar to relative autonomy. And they essentially served as a military class. So why would the Don Cossacks be faced with, right, as we would call it now, genocide? Well, that's, that's quite simple. Uh, this ethnic group is also a military core of the Tsarist empire, right? And so in order to break that military core of trained, concentrated, right, military enemies, who were privileged under the previous regime, you split them up, right? And that would be the reason for the Don Cossacks. Uh, the purges in the military, again, uh, the Red Army was formed under Trotsky. And many of those Red Army officers, because they were trained and led by Trotsky for the early years of the revolution, uh, had a great deal of respect for Trotsky. And one would probably argue a great deal of loyalty to Trotsky. Um, again, how, how does one substantiate these things? It's incredibly difficult. But also, when there's literally fascists at the gates, um, the question is, what do you do? Um, of course, I, I think all of us would agree that if the Soviet Union were in a completely peaceful, if, if the United States today just wholeheartedly voted, oh, you know what, let's be socialist. Uh, even Trotsky, even Lenin, even Stalin thought that if the United States went socialist, we would have no need whatsoever for any execution. 
In fact, Trotsky ironically refers that if America went socialist, he said, you know, we could probably afford to put all of the rich people on their own private island and supply them with every luxury they could possibly enjoy until they die. And then they would just leave us alone. But it's not the case at the Soviet Union, either at the time of the revolution or throughout any of its history. It was always a besieged state. Um, and so in this case, you, many might not agree with the purging of possible Trotskyists in, in the military. But what is really important to note is the Bolsheviks in overthrowing the Tsar literally advocated for revolutionary defeatism. They advocated for soldiers and generals to lose battles to hasten revolution. So often, right, Stalin is portrayed as, right, being ultra critical of failure. So critical of failure that he would murder people for failing him for the last time. Uh, however, again, there was a political precedence of failure, not simply being failure, but actually being a political tactic. So, again, the main purges you have is you have collectivization that starts in basically 29, 233. That's peasants not giving it over. Um, you have the power struggles between the party, which aren't particularly bloody. Um, in the mid-20s, it leads to Trotsky's exile. And then you also have the purges um, leading into the 30s. So uh, I believe it starts in late 37 and goes to 39. This would be the officer corps, um, again, because the Red Army was trained under Trotsky. And there's reason to believe that Trotsky had a great deal of influence among these people. Does that answer more directly your question? Basically, yes. Although two additional questions uh, born up from that. What portion of the purgings or similar things were uh, preempted before there was an actual threat or attack? And what portion of people were executed versus exported? Um, the actual vast amount of people were exported. That's, this is the easier question to ask. Deportation to the gulags was a lot, a lot more frequent than executions. And it's also worth noting that in many ways, um, the Gulag membership wasn't nearly as long as people were sentenced for. People were in and out of the Gulags relatively frequently. Um, they were incredibly brutal. Many people starved to death. Um, also, this is true of regular Russia, regular Soviet Union, regular Ukraine. Um, so, What do you mean they were in and out of the Gulag? Well, I mean, it, it's actually very funny. The Black Book of Communism is a good example of this. Uh, what it will say is there was an uprising of 500 people, and those people were sentenced to a thousand years in the gulag. Right? But you'll notice if you have 500 people and they're sentenced to a thousand years in the gulag, that's two years. Right? Uh, if you were having an uprising against the American government today, it's very unlikely you would get two years in prison. And moreover, a lot of sentences were commuted, especially of the army officers after the Nazis invaded. Um, after, uh, so I'm just using this as, as an example. Um, a lot of those officers were sentenced to the gulag, right, the special labor prisons. When the Nazis invaded, Stalin and the central leadership realized they needed a trained officer corps. And so many of those officers were brought back out. So this is just one concrete example Right, of a sentence being commu uh, commuted much lower. And this happened a lot to a lot of people in a lot of ways. You would have um, the Soviet gleaning laws, for example. Gleaning is where you take bits of grain that are not, um, that are not picked up in the harvest, and you keep them for yourself. The initial Soviet gleaning laws and laws about state property uh, called for execution. And this was carried out sometimes. Uh, actually, it was carried out relatively frequently. Percentage-wise, it was very low, but it, it carried out relatively frequently. Well, the leadership suddenly realized, hey, we have this really repressive law that is killing a lot of people. So they changed it to time in the gulag. And then they realized, oh, wow, we're sending a lot of people to the gulag, and they reduced the sentences. And so what you have is you have the institution of various laws and policies that, when carried out, are relatively brutal. but are often not carried out in completion. They are mitigated either by pardons or amnesties, or they're just you know, reduced in the law themselves. Uh, so it makes estimates very difficult. Um, if you're looking for body count, 
Uh, it's high, but again, Black Book of Communism. Um, if, if you're fascinated by figures, especially figures devoid of any context, I'd highly recommend them. Um, if you prefer context, uh, there's no easy answer. There are a lot of different sources. There are a lot of archival sources. And you just, if, it's, if it's of actual interest to you, then you need to just go through historically looking at it. So does that answer your question of the, and what was, what was the first question again? Was um, how much of the purgings or similar were preemptive, as in before any Trotskyists actually made any threat against the government, before any of these people actually were shown well, to be those Trotsky? Yeah, I mean, actually, quite a few. The collectivization was a direct result to Kulak's withholding food. So that one, now any given individual Kulak, this is what's difficult of class analysis, right? The Kulaks as a class were withholding food, but how does one pinpoint any given individual person as the one withholding food? All you know is you have a class of rich peasants and you have less food in the market than you should have. Now, right, finding the individual person who is withholding it is incredibly difficult, which is why they had to send people out to each given farm. Um, but in this case, right, that was not exactly pre preempted. Does this make sense? Right. It was an internal threat, but it wasn't an individual threat that this particular Kulak is doing it and that particular Kulak is doing it. And this is why, for example, um, and this actually led to excesses, uh, why they asked poor peasants to report on the rich peasants, right? I, I believe they were called uh, mazukas. Were supposed to, who were the regular peasants, to report the kulaks. Because the Bolsheviks actually had a great deal of modesty in this regard. They didn't believe that bureaucrats, um, and I, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, I mean people who work in the state apparatus, or officers, or army officials, will know the circumstances of a given area, which is why they relied on right, lesser farmers. Only problem with that is if they have an axe to grind, if they have a grudge, but of course, right, the answer is, What's the other alternative? If you have a class that's threatening to starve your country, you, what, in which way can you identify the individuals? Except by, again, the exigencies of trusting the people. Does that answer? Yes. Um, and as for the Trotskyist, Trotsky was, Trotskyist literature was being brought into the Soviet Union from his exile. As soon as he was exiled, he was writing circulars, degrading Stalin, denigrating the uh, Central Committee, calling it a Thermidorian reaction, calling it a uh, failed work or a corrupted, no, degenerate worker state. To give Trotsky this credit, um, but this is a very superficial credit to give him, uh, he called for the defense of the Soviet Union against Nazism. Um, but if you denigrate every single aspect of the Soviet Union all the way up to the invasion and then say, oh yeah, but you should really defend this, right? You could probably see how that, that's not a, a really good defense of one's actions. Does that answer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking of a comment Zizek makes in regards to the French Revolution, which is, you know, looking back on it, you know, some people say, oh, well, it, it could have been different, you know, some, you know, whatever. He's like, no, it absolutely could not be different. We had to go through this zero level of Jacobinism and all the, the French terror and whatnot in order to establish the Republic. Um, and I guess given the fact that you, know, you wrote a paper recently um, kind of arguing if you don't have Maoism, you get Stalinism or Marxist Stalinism practiced very rigorously through war communism instituted. So uh, given the fact that you're also a Maoist, uh, what do you see that could have been maybe possibly done different or do you think what's done was done and well, carried out to a T? Uh, obviously, there's two things, right? Um, what's done is, is done, right? And, and we need to recognize this, and uh, rigorously what we need to do is examine this history of what really did happen. And this is why I said, if you want to know what really happened, you need to get into the text. And it's not going to be perfect, but this notion of history and the knowledge of history is something valuable worth pursuing. Um, but along a, a different tack, every history also offers an alternative history, right? every history through its actualization offers critical junctures whereby perhaps things could have been different, not in this sort of alternate history that, oh, we could be living someplace different, but the lessons of that history are sometimes the lessons of its failure. For example, the collapse of the Soviet Union doesn't teach us, oh, well, if only I could go back to 1940 and change this or that policy. 
what it teaches us is these particular institutions of the Soviet Union, an over-reliance on, for example, the state apparatus rather than mass movements, um, the reliance on uh, legal procedures rather than informal democratic procedures. Um, plenty of people died under the Cultural Revolution, but there's also another interesting feature. Plenty of people committed suicide under the Cultural Revolution because they felt so ashamed for being, right, uh, uh, being accused of being a capitalist, being accused of being, um, you know, a bureaucrat. And in fact, Lenin writes about this while he's, he's dying at the end of his life. He says, you know, we can, we can perhaps adopt new methods free of the normal strictures of the state, uh, measures perhaps with humor or, uh, you know, unique and creative. Um, for example, I, I think one of the examples he gives is uh, finding a bureaucrat who's abusing his post, right, and leaving him a letter saying, oh, by the way, we, how, how are these accounts going? And yes, we know how these accounts are going. Almost like a joke, right? So that he realizes, yes, he's under scrutiny. Yes, we know what he's doing, but not necessarily carrying out the strictures of, right, legal, rigorous enforcement of, for example, corruption, which might lead to time in the gulag or an execution. So in this case, right, the spontaneity, the mass movement of Mao, especially exemplified by the Cultural Revolution, the early part, early and middle parts of the Cultural Revolution, I think are a check on what people constitute Stalinism or, right, state Marxist-Leninism. Does that answer? In a sense. I mean, more specifically, I guess, I mean, you often make a distinction like, oh, some of the things Stalin did were justified and then they're excessive and therefore just... Why did he do this? Like Doctor's plot, for example. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, and uh, I think Mao sums it up nicely, which was Stalin was seventy percent good, thirty percent bad. <laughs> and of course, the real the real danger of history is figuring out which was the seventy and which was the thirty. Um, near the end of Stalin's life, there was something called the Doctor's plot, and basically he set up an, a long, rigorous or a elaborate um, setup to basically accuse uh, Jewish intellectuals and uh, specifically doctors of attempting to poison the Soviet leadership. And so of course, right, the usual refrain is this is anti-Semitism at its worst, right, Stalin, the backwards Georgian, again, because he wasn't Russian, he was an ethnic minority. Um, actually, let me contextualize that. Stalin's father was a freed serf and a cobbler, and he was a, an ethnic minority. For comparison, this would be, and he was the immediate successor of Lenin, this would be if after the Civil War, a black from Mexico became the president of the United States. So, so keep that in mind, right, that Stalin himself as a leader, right, I, I mean, obviously this, this will be misinterpreted, right, but that, that's a very Barack Obama moment, right, that the son of a cobbler yeah, anyway, is, is the leader. But of course, right, what they, basically, the accusation is, well, he's just an uneducated Jordan Jin. Here's just his prejudice coming out, and he's going crazy. But it's also worth noting, Stalin and the Soviet Union supported Israel. And they actually supported Israel as uh, a positive good. They thought that the influx of um, the Jews into Israel would actually be beneficial for the Soviet Union, because keep in mind, who owns the Middle East right now? The British. And the British are active and hostily opposed to the Soviet Union. So, right, mo many of these Jews are coming from the Soviet Union or were freed by the Soviets. And they see this as, hey, this is going to support us. Um, and this is going to be a positive motion. Um, right? Jews in Europe had a history of radicalism. Right? I mean, Marx was a, ethnically Jewish. Right? Um, and so they thought, hey, this state of Israel could be something very, very positive for the world and for the Middle East, as opposed to the you know, British imperialism, very quickly Israel becomes a client state of the United States, um, and in turn of Europe, um, Western Europe, that is. And so again, the doctor's plot, which basically was a spur to anti-Semitism, or would function as a spur to anti-Semitism, itself was, I think, unjustified. So let me be clear, but also understandable given the context 
of Israel, its position relative to the Soviet Union, and the dangers it posed to socialist movements in the region. But again, right, historical exigencies, in this case, I think the doctor's plot is definitely part of that 30% bat. There's no justification for characterizing uh, the code word was cosmopolitanism, right, uh, and Jewish people um, as somehow an internal threat because of political ends. I think that goes, uh, that goes too far. Because a kulak, a rich peasant, can always stop being a kulak. All they have to do is give up all their wealth and join a collective farm. But a Jew, or a black, or an Asian, or a Japanese, can never stop being, right, Jewish, if the term is ethnically, right? And so again, this is, this is one of the fundamental distinctions that separates the Soviet Union and its political genocide, if we're going to accept such a ridiculous term, from the Holocaust or the ethnic genocide of Nazi Germany. Does that? Yeah, I mean, that's sufficient. Um, the next thing I would say, too, is that maybe if you want to just, this is a question for you to answer, but uh, what's, what's the worst way to get on Stalin's bad side? Oh, that's well, good stories. Yeah, again, um, I would if, if you're interested, it's a terrible, it, it's a terrible, terrible biography, politically speaking. It's just devoid of context. But if you're interested in knowing about Stalin the person, in the court of the Red Tsar is really good for that. Um, people would ask Stalin favors. The, the the very easiest way to get Stalin very angry and disgusted with you would be to ask for a personal favor. Um, Molotov, right? who was the foreign minister, his wife actually came under suspicion, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, she was in prison. So you have inner party leadership being in prison, and they knew not to ask Stalin for a favor, not to ask Stalin to you know, pull some strings. There was nothing he hated more than personal favors being done in the political realm. And so, again, this doesn't, this doesn't speak to the historical or philosophical or theoretical aspect, um, but this, this notion of Stalinism right, is, again, not about personal power. It's not about personal caprice, personal whim, or ego, right, e egotism. Um, and ironically, if you want a, a relatively balanced um, uh, biography of Stalin, I highly recommend relatively balanced. Uh, Isaac Dutcher's uh, Stalin, a political biography, and Isaac Dutcher is actually uh, a Trotskyist, um, but he manages to put aside most of his vitriol and give a, a fairly good good view of Stalin. So, is that... Well, I was actually going to say if you talked about his son during the war. Oh, yeah, this is another thing. Uh, Stalin's son, eldest son, was a pilot and got shot down and captured by the Germans. And they actually offered to exchange his son for a German general. And he said, you have a million of my sons. And if you're not going to release all of them, then I cannot ask for you to just release one. And in fact, his son later died in a Nazi prison camp. Um, I believe he walked into the electric fence because he was so distraught that his father wouldn't trade a high-ranking general for him. But again, we're not dealing with personal interest. We're not dealing with egotism. We're not dealing for someone who wants personal benefits or an easy life or just mad power and luxury, right? We have a Marxist-Leninist thrown into a historical situation where they do the best they can with the resources they have and the knowledge they have. Does anybody have any further questions for Greg? Yes. Yeah. Um, First of all, just like a comment on the World War II, like the Soviet Union winning World War II. But I agree completely. Like you look at the casualties, and the Soviet Union has a fair deal more than the rest of the Allies combined. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's pretty massive. And then uh, just again back to the purges. Um, what was the trial like? If there was a trial, they were almost there. This very. Um, there were two. Two main ways of having a trial. Uh, there was the general process of the trial, which were under the troikas. 
And a troika, like most revolutionary tribunals, were just that, tribunals. Um, so generally speaking, there were three members. Any member, I believe any member could say, could, could withhold the verdict. Either, either it was a majority rule or one member could veto the other two members. I, I have to look into that. Um, but the troika would basically decide on a case. Um, sometimes they would deliberate for quite some time. Oftentimes it was a matter of minutes. If, you, if the troika came into a Pulak farmhouse and there were gold inlays on a grandfather clock and there was a barn full of slaughtered uh, cattle right, and burned fields, it was very easy for them to make their decision, which would almost usually be carried out on the spot as a form of execution. More difficult cases would go weeks or months. Um, and the most famous Stalinist trials are the show trials. Right? This is what most people refer to as the travesty of justice. Um, interestingly enough, uh, a really good philosophical defense, probably the best philosophical defense of Stalinism comes from you know, those very authoritarian, you know, anti-individualistic uh, French existentialists. Um, Maurice Maliot-Ponty, uh, who again, French existentialist, has a book called uh, Humanism and Terror. Or, no, I'm sorry, Communism and Terror. No, it's Humanism and Terror. Is it Humanism and Terror? Okay, it's been a while since I read it. But in it, he actually gives a long philosophical defense of, an existential philosophical defense of Stalinism. Uh, and one of these things is, uh, the show trials are only a show trial if you don't understand what you're looking for. For example, um, Bukharin is asked if he is forming a, a plot or Zinoviev is asked that he's forming a plot with the Trotskyists to um, overthrow the Soviet government. Right? It's a ridiculous claim if it's taken simply as that. Are you actively plotting to overthrow the government? Zinoviev, old Bolshevik, of course says no. But then there's a question, were you contacted by people who attempted to overthrow the Soviet government? And he says yes. And they said, well, did you turn them in? He said, no, I didn't turn them in. Well, then by not turning them in, didn't you objectively serve to overthrow, to attempt to overthrow, right, the Soviet government? And of course he says, yes, I did. So you have people confessing. It, it's, it's very interesting. The things that they are resistant to is subjective guilt. You'll, you'll find very few of those old Bolsheviks admitting to subjective guilt in the sense that, yes, I actively worked with the fascists, like saying this just right out of the blue, I actively worked with the fascists. But what you'll see is a line of reasoning, which is, yes, I was contacted with people who would work with the fascists. No, I did not turn them in, right? And so given the existential conditions, right, the threat of invasion by fascists, right, and a restoration of capitalism or fascism in the Soviet Union, right, the show trials are actually, um, basically one of the best examples of existentialism in practice that one can have. And I personally take this line, which many people don't share, is I believe that the old Bolsheviks were genuine communists. As a matter of fact, they believe in the victory of the proletariat. They had served the Soviet Union to the best of their abilities. Um, they had a subjective intention to spread worldwide communism. They had a subjective intention to support the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, had Bukharin been successful in overthrowing Stalin, right, and defending the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany, then Bukharin would be justified. But the very fact that he comes to trial, the very fact that the power is weak enough to not overthrow Stalin only serves to weaken the Soviet Union, objectively speaking, regardless of anyone's individual attention or intentions. And so in this sense, Right? Taking responsibility does not mean taking responsibility in the sense of one's intentions. Well, I never meant to do this. Right? And so I think the old Bolsheviks are actually quite courageous in that they're willing to take responsibility. They are willing to take responsibility for their objective failures. But, they, and again, they should be congratulated for this, they are fiercely unwilling to take responsibility for subjective failures. Right? They refuse to admit that they talked with a German agent, or they talked with, you know, a fascist and talked to institute fascism. 
but they did talk to someone who was willing to work with the Germans, and thus did objectively help Nazi Germany. Does that answer your question? Yes. Any additional questions? Okay. Well, then unless there's any last ones, I guess we'll uh, call it call this to a close. All right. Let's give Greg a hand.